bit by bit, I'm going to show images of arachnoid cysts. Arachnoid cysts are very common and we see them often on CT and MRI. Arachnoid cysts have a prevalence of 1 to 2 percent and one of the studies where these numbers come from was a study from 2006 where they looked at two and a half thousand healthy males from the army. A little bit more than 50% of arachnoid cysts occur in the temporal region and this is a typical location of an arachnoid cyst. Arachnoid cysts are extra axial cysts filled with CSF so they have low signal on T1, high signal on T2 and arachnoid cysts have exactly the same signal intensity as CSF on flare images. These T2 and flare images are from a male patient with a very large arachnoidal cyst that was interpreted as an asymptomatic arachnoidal cyst because despite the compression of the left hemisphere, the patient had no language difficulties. He even spoke three languages. Arachnoid cysts can disappear spontaneously. There are several case reports about that. And this is a case report about a three-year-old boy who had an arachnoid cyst in the temporal pole and insular cistern that disappeared on follow-up MRI at the age of five. And there are also case reports where it has been shown that such a large arachnoid cyst has evacuated into the subdual space and then the CSF has been absorbed. So that might be a mechanism of resolution of an arachnoid cyst. Arachnoid cysts can also grow. For example, in this female in her 70s with chronic headaches and progressive left-sided weakness, you can see a very large arachnoidal cyst in a right parietal region that was a lot larger than nine years before. And the arachnoid cysts that grow are Galassi type 2 cysts. And Galassi came up with a classification of arachnoid cysts evaluating the relationship with the subarachnoid space and the ventricular system. So he did a CT cystornography and in type 1 cyst the contrast was visible one hour after administration so there's a wide communication between the cyst and the subarachnoid space. In type 2 cyst there was no contrast in the cyst after one hour but there was after six hours and it had disappeared after 24 hours. So there's probably a wolf-like mechanism and in type 3 Arachnoid cysts, there was no contrast in the cyst after 3 hours, nor after 12 hours and not after 24 hours. So there's no communication between the cyst and the subarachnoid space. To understand how arachnoid cysts are formed, you have to know a little bit about the embryology of the meninges. And we talked about that in the previous video. And this is a human embryo in week 8. And you can see the neural tube with the thick thalamic tissue bordering the third ventricle, the thin neuroepithelium lining the lateral ventricles. And you can see that this neural tube is enclosed by primitive mannings, and the primitive mannings is pretty thick. The primitive mannings is from here to here. You can also see some vessels in this primitive mannings. And the primitive mannings can be divided into the ectomannings, which is going to give rise to the skull and the dura, and the endomannings, which is going to give rise to the pia and the arachnoid. The endomannings is filled with a ground substance made up of glycosaminoglycans or mucopolysaccharides, and there are holes appearing in this ground. Uh, substance due to uh, withdrawal of the ground substance and probably also because of the growth of the skull and these holes become larger and larger and eventually lead to the formation of the subarachnoid space 
with trabecula made up of the remnants of this ground substance with some fenestrations in it. This is an electron microscopic image and you can see the cellular part of the arachnoid membrane. This is the brain and these are the arachnoid trabecula bridging the cellular part of the arachnoid membrane and the brain with blood vessels in the subarachnoid space. And in case of an arachnoid cyst, there are no traversing arachnoid trabecula and there are some split arachnoid membrane. Um, so something went wrong with the cavitation of the endomannings and an alternative theory is that um, when the sylvian fissure appears, the endomannings of the frontal and the temporal region do not fuse correctly and this would also explain why we have more arachnoid cysts in the middle cranial fossa. So the wall of an arachnoid cyst is hyperplastic arachnoid cells and sometimes also thick collagen. There are diseases that have a higher incidence of arachnoid cysts. Uh, mucopolysaccharidosis makes sense because the mucopolysaccharides were the ground substance of the um, endomannings. Um, and autosomal dominant polykystic kidney disease makes some sense because it's a ciliopathy and if the cells do not know where they are, they do not know where they have to form the trabecula. This is an example of a child with an intracranial arachnoid cyst in the middle fossa with a lot of mass effect and if the cysts become symptomatic uh, neurosurgery is an option either open microsurgery um, shunting of the cyst or ventriculoperitoneal shunting or fenestration of the cyst as was done in this case and the um, female patient in her 70s that we discussed before also had surgery of her arachnoid cyst in her right parietal region with improvement of the symptoms two months post-surgery. In the differential diagnosis of an arachnoid cyst is another extraaxial abnormality. So on CT you see something that appears cystic in the posterior fossa with high signal on T2 and only some rim enhancement on T1. And this looks like an arachnoid cyst, although the location is a little bit unusual. And this turned out to be a microcystic meningioma on surgery confirmed during histology. So in the next video, I'm going to continue with another extraaxial abnormality uh, meningioma.